This morning, we are in the third Sunday of the month. And we always take a, a special offering for missions. For those of you who are visiting with us, uh, just please uh, enjoy the time that we're going to be spending together. Um, this is really about us and our commitment to missions. So if you'll just make yourselves ready. Then we do this as a reminder. So many of you will do, do tell me, oh, you know, it's a little cumbersome, but I'm sure glad you, we do that second offering uh, on the third Sunday of the month to remind us about missions. We have missionaries around the world, some in very desperate and dangerous situations. And this is a way, too, for us to be mindful of them and to give God thanks for them. Amen? Praise God. Heavenly Father, we do lift up our missionaries today, those that are around the world, those that have sacrificed much. Others, they haven't sacrificed much, but they've said yes to you and are obedient. Father, it's our joy and a privilege to support them. We pray that our missions giving would continue to grow, that we would not have to say no to any missionary asking for requests, which at present, unfortunately, we do. Father, I pray that you would help us to continue to awaken in our heart's desire to give to missions. Father, I thank you for our faithfulness. Father, for Maranatha's faithfulness, for every person in this room as they commit to missions. Father, I rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. He really is. And it is truly Father's Day. And, you know, there's, there's so many different things with, going on with Father's Day, but um, a little corny, but check this out. Why do the chicken coops only have two doors? Because if they had four, it would be chicken sedans. <laughs> oh my gosh. What do you call a laughing motorcycle? A Yamaha. <laughs> a Yamaha. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the greatest babysitter mentioned in the Bible? David. He rocked Goliath to sleep. At what time of day was Adam created? A little before Eve. Get out of here. What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. <laughs> All right, what do you call a fish with two knees? A two-knee fish. Two -knee. <laughs> I know, it took me a little long. I, late. A cop just knocked on my door and told me that my dogs were chasing people on bikes. My dogs don't even own bikes. <laughs> Did you know the first French fries weren't actually cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that one? I tried to eat a clock the other day. It was really time consuming. <laughs> mwah, mwah. <laughs> Who was the smallest person in the Bible? Ne <laughs> Nehemiah. <laughs> Need an ark? I know a guy. <laughs> How does Moses start his morning? Anybody? He brews a pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Can February March? 
No, but April may. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson. He brought the house down. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord, yeah. Oh, yes, there we go. You know, like Mother's Day, Father's Day is one of those things where, you know, there's so many different things that can be said. Being mindful of the fact that some of you had excellent fathers, some of you had poor fathers, some of you didn't have fathers. Some of you are are happy about your fathering. Some have guilt about your father. I mean, it just goes the whole gamut. And, and, and I think about this idea that, you know, you could go down the serious road talking about the percentages of fatherless homes and the children growing up in poverty and drugs and promiscuity and jail, and, and they are atrocious, and we could spend hours on that. And then there's this whole idea of one-liners. You know, there's just these wonderful little Quippics of you know fathers type stuff like a home without a father is like a body without a spine. Jim Gaffigan, uh, Jim Gaffigan, you know you familiar with Jim Gaffigan, comedian, pretty clean. Uh, my wife and I have laughed to him many for a long time. Um, he does a thing on bacon. You gotta look it up. Bacon. Okay, Jim Gaffigan. He said there should be a song. If you're happy and you know it, keep it to yourself and let your dad sleep. <laughs> I thought, I was just thinking about this. So this is my little one-liner for Father's Day, okay? Um, this is it. Children's gifts to parents. Stretch marks for mom, stress marks for dad. Okay, I'm not going to be a comedian. I'll, I will definitely not go down that road. Um, you know, then, then there's the whole sappy, you know, the Hallmark style stuff. <laughs> Carla, here we go. Here we go. This, this kind of stuff is so sappy. I, I just, I, I feel like I take a shower after I read it. What makes a dad? God took the strength of a mountain the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of the night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Does that not have Hallmark written all over it? Okay, you guys. I have enough Hallmark shirts. I have enough Hallmark socks. We don't, I don't need any more. Thank you very much. Thank you. What was that? Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Um, I do look, look forward to the ideas. You know, I like to just challenge guys. Ladies, we like to just pat you on the back and say how wonderful you are. And, and I want to do some of that as with men as well, but... I want to just talk just for a moment about this, this whole idea of being a guy, okay? Because I think we're losing it in society. Um, Coach K, Jeff uh, Kasaya, he's got an international ministry to men. Uh, he's referred to as Coach K. Um, in fact, he was at Maranatha a couple of years ago, and he was, his jaw was hitting the floor. Here he goes around and speaks at all these places. He talks about men's stuff. He came here, and he goes... You guys, he said, you guys are like on top of it. Man, you guys are men stuff dripping around here. Um, here's what he, he did. He went to 40 different states, over 800 churches in five years. And he observed the majority tend to focus on three subgroups in the congregation. Can you tell me what they are? Just take a guess. What do you think they are? Three subgroups are always emphasized in the church. 
Children's ministry, yes. Women's ministry, yes. And youth, you nailed it. You got it. Women's, youth, and children's. He noticed that nowhere is there an emphasis on men's ministry, or, or rarely. I have to admit, Maranatha, and you all know it, we have a very strong male culture. Um, it, just, it just wipes every bit of estrogen off a man when he walks through the doors of the church. <laughs> it, it, it's like a blower that just kind of whoosh, off it goes. And by that, just the sheer contrast of, of a man being a man and a woman being a woman, there's, there's just this contrast. It's a, it's a lovely and wonderful thing. I agree, and we all, men, amen, we agree with God when he made a woman. He said, it is good. I'm giving you opportunity to score points, guys. You should have seized that one a little louder. You really should have. I'm just letting you know ahead of time. You should have just jumped on it. But we do have a, a strong male culture, and, and I want to just touch on the purpose of men's ministry around here. This isn't going to be the entirety of my message. I really want to get to something else, but I do want to take a moment and just stand here for a moment, because if you don't come to man church, uh, you don't hear me talk about this stuff. And this is the, the area that I usually bring out man, at man church or at our men's conference. When I emphasize again and again and again, this is the purpose of men's ministry at Maranatha. Number one, there's four things. Number one, it's to help you grow. You hang around man stuff, I understand that our number one goal for men's ministry is to help you, as a man, to grow. Because sometimes, if you're not getting kicked in the butt, you're just going to be lazy. Men, even more so than women, are like electricity. We take the path of least resistance. Our goal is to help you grow. Now, to help you grow is in four areas, and you're familiar with it. At Maranatha, you're all familiar with this. Luke 2.52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, favor with God and man. We want to help you grow in wisdom. We don't want you to be as smart as a box of rocks. We, we want you to be intelligent. We want to impress upon you the study of the scriptures so that you know the word of God, that you are, can speak intelligently. You can give a defense of your faith. Instead of just saying, well, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in God because my parents do. No, it's got to be a little more than that. Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. Uh, we want to help you grow physically. You know, in, in the Christian church, it has always just amazed me how we're so against suicide. We're against smoking and drinking, but you can weigh 400 pounds and it's no problem. Please understand, being overweight is not a big issue for me, but then neither is smoking and drinking. My idea and the concept here is we get things out of balance. We take our, well, we like this, we're going to really hammer on this, but this, uh, we're going to just ignore. Isn't our whole life about self-control? To be physically healthy. You don't got to be Charles Atlas, but you got to be healthy, because here's the deal. If you're not being healthy, it's a f slow form of suicide. And yet we condemn suicide, but we, we don't say a word about getting healthy. So if you're going to be around the men's ministry around here, we're always, man, I'm always on your case. Because we want to see you grow mentally, physically, spiritually. Jesus grew in favor with God to grow spiritually. Gentlemen, there's no excuse. Your wife is not the leader of your home. You're not necessarily either. Together you are. <laughs> okay? Together you are. You know, there, there is none of this macho ego. That, well, the guy is the priest of the house. You know, it's like, you ought to be a bold, strong leader. As long as you understand what true leadership is. True leadership is servanthood. He who is the servant of all, or of the leader of all, is going to be the servant of all. He's the servant of all as a leader. This means you, you're going to be high, called to a higher quality and a higher calling of servanthood if you want to be a leader. This, this other kind of leader stuff, that's just a bunch of macho, egotistical fluff. You know what that usually is? It's a man who's very insecure trying to pump up the image, I'm all that. <laughs> we know you're not. <laughs> we want to help you grow socially. 
You know, it, again, this idea of we want to help you grow. And, and our personalities are a huge part of being a Christian. I know people who know the Bible, they know it so well, but nobody wants to be around them. So it does absolutely no good. Jesus, obviously, he's our savior, our master. Sinners and saints alike liked him. Sinners were drawn to him. People's guilt. Sometimes in our arrogance or in our ignorance, we kind of say, well, yeah, these non-Christians don't like to be around me because I'm so godly. No, it's because you're a jerk. <laughs> and you're insensitive. You do not know how to relate to people, to put their concerns ahead of yours. You're so busy talking about yourself, you never listen to what they have to say. You never ask a question. Socially. We want to help you grow. Number two in men's ministry around here, the number, second goal is to understand and embrace being male. Now, most of what I talk about in this category, I can't talk here in mixed company. But we need to understand what it is to be male. I remember years ago, Bill Gother said that 80% of the men leave the church because of their struggles with uh, um, uh, the female uh, on their mind. And because they can't get rid of it, because they, they get this mystical idea that, well, if I just get spiritual enough, I won't think about that anymore. That is an erroneous thought. There's this chemical in your system called testosterone. It is one of the most powerful drugs. Before puberty, you take a young boy, there could be anything he can, it, nothing will affect him. He'll just, well, yeah, that's interesting. But as soon as that powerful chemical called testosterone gets in there, he's like, woo! Woo! I see it in the clouds. I see it in the... I... You ladies don't get it sometimes. You think, well, you got a problem. No, I don't. Everything's working just the way it was designed. And until you and I understand this idea of design, we'll always have a problem. So we, in men's ministry, I talk a lot about we need to understand and embrace being male instead of always, because I got this idea. I, I grew up in the church and I've seen it, and they don't really do this intentionally, but if you were just a little softer, if you were just a little more gentle, if you, you want to turn me into a woman and that means of being a good Christian? No, I'm a, I'm a dynamite Christian. I love God. But I'm not going to turn into a woman to prove to somebody else that I'm a good Christian. No, I rip and tear, break and smash. Yeah. <laughs> I'm loud. I wreck things. I, you know, make mistakes. I... We do, amen, gentlemen? I have to admit, I have a gentle side. When I'm on my chopper and the thing is so nasty, loud, and I pass a minivan, I do cringe a little bit, hoping there's not a baby in there. I'm going to wake up. I have a tender side. It actually does concern me. So when I, when I see a minivan up ahead that I'm going to be passing, I give her the juice, make a little noise behind it, so that when I get up to it, I can kind of let off the throttle and go right by it. And the driver will go, my, that's a pretty looking bike. I like how quiet it is. <laughs> we understand and embrace being male. The third goal of men's ministry around here is to provide opportunities for you. Three opportunities that we are focused on all the time for men. We want to provide an opportunity, because here's the deal. I can't make you do anything, nor can anybody else. Nobody can make you do anything. All we can do is provide opportunities. If you don't seize the opportunities, you lose. Because when we get to number four, you're gonna understand why you lose. The third goal is to help you grow. I mean, it is to uh, provide opportunities for you to do three things. Number one, grow. Okay, refer back to point number one, okay? We wanna provide opportunities for you to do that. Number two, we wanna provide opportunities for you to be involved. We offer things, we're constantly telling you, come join us, be involved. And then lastly, we give you opportunities to serve because every one of us are called to serve. Number four, the fourth major men's ministry influence that we have around here is to help you fulfill God's plan for your life. It's different than mine. 
Every one of us has a different calling. We have a different... Our job is to find a way to fulfill, to help you fulfill God's plan for your life. Because here's the thing, gentlemen. You are gonna stand before God. Not me, not the deacon board, not the board, not any... You're gonna stand before God. And God is gonna hold you accountable to what I asked you to do. How come you never did what I asked you to do? I realize that sitting here right now, there are some of you who you know, and you've known it for years. What are you ta- what's taking you so long? You know that God's been asking and provoking in you something to do, and you've been holding back, you've been waiting for the right opportunity, or you got excuses. God, men are good at excuses, aren't we? Ladies? Oh, ladies, I gave you a great opportunity. <laughs> Us guys, we are great at finding excuses, aren't we? Ladies? Amen. We are. I can't tell you the list of things that my wife has waited for me to get around to, and someday I'm going to get around to it. And we lie at times without even knowing it. Are you following with me? I've realized I've lied to my wife for 39 years. I've been aware of it for a while. I realized it probably eight years ago. It just dawned on me. I have lied to my wife our whole marriage. I've told her, honey, it's going to slow down. <laughs> it hasn't. There's always been something. It's like, well, we got the new building. We got to build a building. We got to do this. We got this. We got this thing going. This is on my plate. And I've been asked to serve as a presbyter. And I got to do this. I got to, you know, it's like, I've lied to her for 39 years. Honey, it's going to slow down. It hasn't. Now, is my wife in the house this morning or is she busy somewhere? Oop, she's right there. <laughs> um, I was going to let you in on a little secret. Now, what's really funny, uh, it was a, quite a little few years back now that Orlean got hired and she's on staff. And um, it's really kind of funny because she used to, she was so gracious, so patient, obviously. You know, I'm, I'm fondly teasing here a little bit. But, you know, I was oftentimes not home in time for dinner. I was late, and, you know, Samson, in, in second grade, when they were asked what your dads do, he said, my dad goes to meetings. <laughs> if you think about it from his perspective, Dad, where are you going? I'm going to a meeting. Every night, Dad, where are you going? I'm going to a meeting. Where are you going? He, so what, what did your dad do? Dad goes to meetings. Um, so Orlean, same thing. And again, I'm tugging cheek here a little bit. But, you know, Mike, hey, you're out there at church. You come home late. You told me you'd be home at 6, you know, and what's the deal? And Okay, here's the funny thing. It turned around when she got on staff because she'd tell me she'd be home by 5 or 6 or whatever. All of a sudden, it's 7, it's 8, it's 9 o'clock, and she walks in the door. And me, being just the booger head I can be sometimes, I said, so, it was really easy to leave the office, wasn't it? There's always something. There's some... It was... It's not easy to say to somebody, no. It's all important. The reality is we haven't spent our lives selfishly, but it's always been for, anyway. It's kind of interesting. Provide opportunities, gentlemen. We try to provide opportunities for you to prepare to meet your God. Because you are gonna stand before God and you're gonna give an account of your life. Your wife's not going to be there to say, oh, he was a good husband. You are standing by yourself before the creator of the universe. And gentlemen, here's the thing. That's exciting. What I want to try to stir within you, that's exciting. You need to go after it. Don't be pursuing everything in this life. Pursue the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, and all these things shall be added back unto you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, Maranatha, we have a very strong male culture here. And with that... I rejoice. I get excited. But I want to challenge you with, uh, and, and this is going to be the beginning of my message, okay? <laughs> kind of, sort of. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'd like you to open to 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When it comes to Father's Day or being a man, this particular verse, to me, is... I just love this concept. If you, if you take the setting of it, King David, King David is dying. 
everything he's been through and everything that we know about David's life, all his victories, his defeats, his humanity, how he was a shepherd, he was a poet, he was a warrior, he was a king, he was an adulterer. I mean, this, this guy, here he's at the end of his life. And I don't know about you, but deathbed stuff is kind of interesting. I've heard some interesting things people have whispered to me on their deathbed. People have confessed to all kinds of things. And again, it's really funny, a little, little bunny trail, I count it an incredible privilege and what a sacred trust to realize these people want to get this off their chest before they meet their God. I would encourage all of you, don't wait until that point. You may not have it. So anyway, David is here. He is dying. And here, here's verses one and two. Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son saying this. Here's the thing. He's on his deathbed and he just wants to talk to his son, Solomon. I don't know about you, but don't you think the words that are about ready to come out of his mouth are gonna have some weight to them? They do. I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. That's King David. He's on his deathbed. And he says to Solomon, I'm leaving. I want you to prove yourself a man. Don't wimp out on your responsibilities. Be willing to pay the sacrifices required to be a man. I don't know about you, but just... It echoes in my soul hearing David say to his son to prove yourself a man. Be strong, prove yourself a man. I want to share with you five things um, just quickly. I realize it's 10 minutes until we're supposed to be done, but we have no second service anymore. <laughs> We have, we have no second service. I have all the time I want to take. Okay? It's easy to see that, you know, through different generations and societies and cultures, the different requirements that are deemed necessary to be a man, you know, can change a little bit. But there are some fundamental things that all cultures, all societies have held as foundationally important for being a dad, for being a man. In fact, the first, we have to understand, it is fundamental. It almost doesn't need to be stated, but we're going to state it anyway. Gentlemen, you haven't even started on the road of being a man until you're a man of faith. What's really ironic is the devil have fooled, has fooled people to say, you're a real man, you don't need that religion stuff. That is a lie. To be a real man, you need to understand what it is to be surrendered to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You need to understand who is greater than you. You need to understand and be submitted to the one who's the true leader of all. If you understand and recognize that, you are well on your way to becoming a leader. But when we come to that place where we don't think that we need anybody else, you are a loser. There has got to be an overwhelming sense of humility to realize that I am not God. And there is one, and I need to be a worshiper of him. So to be... Uh, when David says to Solomon, he says, be strong and show yourself a man. What's really interesting is he then gives... The next verse, he does explain it in verse 3. He says the very next words of his mouth is basically the instructions how to do that. He says, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commands, his judgments, and his testimonies. 
as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do wherever you turn. He, David says, you want to show yourself strong? Be a man? You need to walk in his ways. You need to keep his word, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies. You need to be a man that is after God's heart. The things that God talks about needs to be important to you. Tragically today, we try to be men of God and say, well, you know, I really like this part. Well, I don't like that part. Or, well, God will overlook this aspect of my life. No, he doesn't overlook anything. It's you and I who show our weakness in our inability to submit to him in his teaching. Be strong and show yourself a man. Comes with number one, and first of all, being a man of God, fearing God, having a healthy fear of God. Number two, foundationally, you know how you show yourself a man? You go to work. Now, please understand, I understand that there are some real reasons why some can't. Uh, There's an illness, there's a disability, there's an injury. Please understand that I understand that. Um, There are some situations where uh, there are dads that stay at home. I'm not referring to that either. There are certain situations where um, mom, for different callings in life in your your family, she's off at work and dad's a stay-at-home dad. Then your job is to get up early before your wife. You make her breakfast. Send her off on a good day. You take care of those kids. I mean, you understand with me? We're going to... But by and large, there's this idea that you go to work. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And then to Adam, God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In the toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Have you ever wondered why sometimes you have days that you're like, God, nothing's going right this day. Have you ever had those days? Nothing goes right? That's because of this verse right here. There's going to be thorns in your day. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. We are dirt balls. We are glorified dirt balls. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of his ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So basically, we are glorified dirt balls. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says simply, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an evildoer, worse than an unbeliever. You see, when David said to Solomon, be strong and show yourself a man. Be a man of faith. Go to work. Number three, go home after work. Go home after work. So many times families are ruined because dad is so selfish. He's got to run around with his friends. got to run around with his buddies. Not, granted, there's a time for that. But you know something? When work is over, you go home. You go home. Friends and hobbies are fine. But I have noticed so many times, especially men, young men in their 20s, I see them. They're always with their friends. Well, where are you ever home with your wife, your children? You see, to be strong and show yourself a man means you go to work. It means that you go home after work. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You go straight home. Well, I deserve this. I work really hard. What, you think your wife at home with those demon-possessed little ones, that's not work? That's work. She's waiting for you to get there. Number four. Number four. The quality of being strong and showing yourself a man is you understand sacrifice. 
You cannot be a man, a strong leader in society without understanding sacrifice. You don't get to do what you always want to do. You need to say no to yourself. Colossians 3.17, it says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get to do what you always want to do. Again, unless you're this selfish little island out there, if you do that, don't call yourself a Christian. Don't call yourself a Christian. Because you can't live that way and be one. Our nation is so indebted to so many who have sacrificed. We just came off celebrating 75 years of those brave soldiers that stormed Normandy. I, I like it where uh, we just read the clip or we've seen it where it was described to us. You know, we, we often envision these old men storming the, the, the beaches. They weren't. They were 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. With a whole future in front of them. But they sacrificed. Not in glorious, as glorious a fashion. But when you sacrifice your TV time to pick up the glove and go out and throw a ball with your son and when you agree, allow your daughter to put a little tutu on you and you get in the yard and you do the little tutu thing. That's a sacrifice that a dad makes. You cannot be a strong man without understanding sacrifice. And then lastly, with this, I will wrap up. He has few secrets. You live your life out loud. None of this dichotomous kind of stuff. You hide. Well, everybody thinks I got this. And you pump up this image. That's not a man. You're living a lie. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You see, to be strong and show yourself a man means you have few secrets. You intentionally live your life out loud. You live your life for everyone to really see what it really is. How many times have you heard me say, I am not interested in you telling me what you believe? I really don't care. Because I will observe your life for a very short time and then I'll tell you what you believe. Oh, you, you listen to some people. Oh, I believe this and I believe this. It's just wonderful, glorious stuff. Problem is you don't do anything. He has few secrets. There's this idea of soundness, integrity. You know, the word integrity comes from something is integrity. It is solid. It's, it's consistent. It's sound. You see, to be a strong man means that. There's soundness to your being, your character. You have few, very few secrets. And the few secrets you might have, you've confided in with a friend or two for the sole purpose of saying, would you pray for me? You see, we realize that we're an example to our children and to others. They will not do as we tell them. They will only do as we do. You see, you can't be a secret. People see right through it. It's not very long that you are discovered. That's why I believe when David said to Solomon, be strong and show yourself a man, one of those qualities are you live your life transparent. Theodore Roosevelt said, there has never yet been a man in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. The men that we remember, the fathers that we praise, are those men that were men of faith. They were men of faith. They were, they were men who knew what it was like to go to work. They came home after work. They came home. I, I remember telling these stories. 
Mm, bunny trail, never mind. I'm not going to go there. Let's suck that right back in right away. They understand sacrifice. They understand sacrifice, and they have few secrets. Gentlemen, as we close, I want to just ask you, are you doing your best? I know this morning, as I was talking, there was a point or two, there's somewhere in there, that something within you rose. You wanted to become drawn to a higher standard. Whatever that was, the Holy Spirit, as it prompted in you, as I was going through some of this material, something within you rose. What is it? Because that's the area you need to pursue. The question is, are you doing your best? Are you doing your best? If not, why? Why? Would you admit to your own selfishness? Would you admit your own habits of, well, you know something? I look forward to that first cocktail when I get home. Problem is, the first cocktail doesn't just stop at one. Is it selfish hobbies? If you're not doing your best, why? Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for every man in this place. I, I like being around them. I like how they challenge and inspire me to bigger and greater things. Father, I thank you for the men in this room that inspire me to be my best. I thank you for the men who they cheer me on. They inspire me to risk, to be bold, to be courageous when at times I'm not. Father, I pray that you'd continue to help us to do that for one another. To be challenged, to be inspired. To hear your voice, Father, Tell us, be strong and show yourself a man. Father, for that we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.